Well, Art, it's obvious there is a, a large variety of living creatures that just got buried all at once. There are, and the range of fossils is, is amazing. We have fossil dinosaur eggs, fossil shells, fossil wood, uh, scoots from crocodiles and things like that, seeds, just a lot of different stuff. So the, there is a almost unlimited range of fossils. Even, even tracks of animals are fo considered fossils. Well, I've heard of, of prints, footprints, footprints being fossilized. Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, and that's, that's what I have on this, this slab right here. This is a piece of uh, Coconino sandstone, and you can see Oh my goodness, you can see the, just jump the out claws. Uh -huh. So this is a creature that's either just walking along or running or something. Right. There are some unique features of their tracks that indicate that these animals were walking uh, underwater, huh. which is very interesting because this is normally thought of as a, as a dune sand, a sand dune. And the Coconino is right in the middle of the rock record in the Grand Canyon. It's lower Permian. Dr. Brand thought, well, that would be a good place to look because these tracks are supposed to be in dry sand, and yet we think it probably was wet. So he began to analyze these tracks, and he found out animals don't make tracks like this in, in dry sand. In fact, if you get any tracks at all, they're just big smears, as you can imagine. But if you have wet sand, or you have sand underwater, then you can get these distinct tracks that show the nice toe marks. Again, you can see these, these toes are really yes. well displayed. Mm -hmm. And that's an indication uh, in Dr. Brand's study that's an indication that they were made underwater. Mm -hmm. So here's a case where, and not everybody in the scientific community likes that conclusion, but it's a case where a creationist who believed in a global flood used that as a hypothesis to study to see if the, that was substantiated by his research, and it was. I suppose it's possible then that the tracks we're looking at is, is a creature who may have been trying to escape. Well, historically, it's interesting that these tracks were considered rep, uh, amphibian tracks. And amphibia live in water, and it was changed to reptiles after Edwin McKee, who studied the sediments in Grand Canyon, after he concluded that the sand was deposited in a sand dune in the desert, then suddenly all the amphibians turned to reptiles, and now they're considered to be reptile tracks. Mm. So it's, there's a lot of latitude in interpreting trackways, sure. yeah. but these certainly seem to be consistent with, with uh, the sand being deposited in water. Do you have uh, evidence, or have you found evidence in, in the fossilized record um, of animals under distress? Uh, are there animals and creatures that appear as if... Um, they just didn't die normally? Well, there are, there are a number of examples where you have whole animal skeletons in which the head is pulled all the way back and the neck is craned back like that. And it was thought for many years that that was because the skeletons were deposited in dry conditions. The animal died and the ligaments in the neck uh, constrained the head, pulled it backwards. Mm -hmm. But more recently, scientists who study these things have discovered that no, it's a, it's a result of drowning. So when you find an animal that has its head pulled all the way back like this, it's because it's drowning. So there's a case where something has come our way, those of us who believe in the flood, uh, as a result of further study, and it has indicated that uh, these animals must have died catastrophically. There are other evidences as well, for example, in dinosaur nests, and there are dinosaur nests with eggs in them, and often these eggs will have a double shell on them. And that's normally should be almost non-existent because animals lay eggs with a single shell. Mm -hmm. But if you stress a chicken, for example, the egg, instead of being laid, will pass back through the uh, process of laying down a shell a second time, and so you'll get a double shell. And that's an indication of stress. Mm. And we find a lot of these in dinosaur nests, we find a lot of these double-shelled eggs. So that's an indication that they were laying their eggs under, under stress. Mm. Now, 
uh, one can only imagine what kind of conditions would cause a dinosaur to lay its eggs during a global catastrophe, but they have to lay them if they're producing them, so right. it would have to happen sometime. And that, uh, that brings us back to a different per uh, perspective of the flood that a lot of times we pass on to children, right? Right. <laughs> the, the, it's like the gentle rain comes down and the, and the floodwaters come up. But this was a catastrophic event, and it was going on over a long period of time, long enough, evidently, for us to maybe consider that dinosaurs uh, the, were stressed in the process of making eggs. Yeah, I, I think... During a year's time, which is the time during which Noah was in the ark, uh, I think the conditions of the flood went on for some time beyond that. There were catastrophic events going on. But at least during that year's time, things happened very differently than the, than the way we visualize them as children. There was a very complex world. That complex world came to an end in a very complex way. And this is why we find fossils in, in North America in a layer of rock, and we find the same kinds of fossils in, in Europe or in, in Africa in the same kind of layer. And this is, this is a global phenomenon. So the world before the flood, whatever it was like, was, was very complex, and the process of the flood was very complex. There were times when, when dinosaurs were walking around leaving tracks, and so the water must have shallowed and gotten deeper. Mm -hmm. There are also places where dinosaurs are leaving only front foot tracks, which means they're probably oh, swimming. swimming. So you get a, a picture of a world that's very complex. Mm. A lot of things that we might not imagine happening were happening, and there was time for that to happen in a global flood. Well, everything that we have talked about um, points to, obviously, a, a great catastrophic event, and that's what we read in Genesis. In particular, a catastrophic event uh, that involved um, the kind of tumultuous processes that are almost unknown uh, to us today. But the, the conventional paradigm would look at this layer that you're digging in, and they would say that those fossils were created a long time ago. What's the approximate age that the conventional paradigm would give to that? These particular bones are cited as being about 65 million years. Okay just below the upper Cretaceous event. And geologists who want to believe that, they can find rationale for believing it. Uh, personally, I don't think the data warrant it, and I, don't, uh, I think that the account that's given in the Bible is a better explanation for what we see on there. What have you found that would uh, cause you to then believe that uh, the flood is recent, and therefore these dinosaur bones are not 65 million years old? Well, it's, that's a very difficult question because none of us have experienced a thousand years. Mm -hmm. We have trouble grasping the changes in a hundred years. And we're asking the question, could these bones be 65,000 times as long as a thousand years? Mm -hmm. And we have no idea if a bone could still maintain all its internal consistency and even the structures of the cells inside the bones. And now, as you know, we're finding um, biomolecules inside these bones. All this, all this is, is a challenge to the idea that we're dealing with 65,000 times as, as long as a thousand years. Uh, we can try some experiments. We can take biomolecules, for example, and we can heat them up and, and cause the rate to be much faster and then try to extrapolate that back to lower temperatures. And that's a fairly scientific thing to do. And when we do that, we get figures for how long a, a protein or, or DNA can last. It's nowhere near 65 million years. Well, Art, you have spent a lot of time in, in digging fossils and analyzing fossils and so forth. The tree of life that we see in our textbooks and on charts and, and so forth and we're taught would say that all of these uh, creatures and even the dinosaurs themselves all uh, came out of one organism in the beginning uh, and, and formed all of the creatures that we see today. What do you see from the scientific evidence that, that you have found? 
I enjoy looking at the so-called phylogenetic tree. It just means groups that are related. So it's talking about the genesis or the origin of groups. And so you see these trees constructed in textbooks. These trees are constructed with branches, and out at the end of the branches are extant groups or groups of fossil organisms. But the branches themselves, the important part, that lead back to some other organism are bereft of meaning. They're just a line drawn on the page. Mm. If this was a real sequence and evolution was the correct explanation for these diagrams, then we ought to see a continuous development of mm. fossils all the way along the tree. But instead, when you're talking about ultimate origins of things, you'll have something uh, question mark at the bottom very often, and then you'll have all these branches coming up. At the end are things that we know, either from fossils or, or that are alive. And where are the data? Mm -hmm. It's just not, it's not telling us anything. Yeah. It's information depauperate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and didn't, uh, my understanding is that Darwin even recognized that uh, there wasn't a lot of data that brought those things together. That's right. It's, it's, not, it's there, not there, and it's not going to be there. Mm -hmm. He thought that perhaps with more study in the fossil record, uh, we would learn more about this. And you can see these cabinets around here are all full of fossils, but they aren't telling us anything about the connecting of, of one form to another. And so you, you really aren't learning anything about the phylogenetic history of life by studying yeah. fossils. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to draw a line on a piece of paper uh, and make you think it's there, but it's another thing to actually find it in the, right. in the data. And I, I'm sure that those who believe in evolution see these lines as concrete. Yes. But I see them as, as question marks, just mm -hmm. conjecture. Yeah. Now, the conventional paradigm would look at that and it would say that that represents uh, different periods of time, vast difference right. of periods of time, and therefore we're seeing these uh, smaller creatures evolving into larger creatures. Um, is that what you see from, from a Genesis paradigm, and can a Genesis paradigm explain that? No, I also have training, as I mentioned, in molecular biology. So when I look at these earliest forms that we find down in the Cambrian, it's very easy to establish that they're fully as complex as anything we have on the Earth today. There isn't an increase in the complexity at the cellular level. There are differences. There are certain complexities in form that are found in things up here that are not found down there. But these all have to do with locomotion, which involves movement from water onto land. And the, the greater complexity of organisms that walk around on land is obvious. That's why we have what we call the mammals. These are animals that mostly live on land, and they're more complex. They have arms and legs and fingers and toes. And if you're a fish, you don't really need those. So you don't have them. Well, Art, I think a lot of us were taught that uh, the life at the bottom is primitive. That's the word that was used, primitive. And so um, that's a little different than what you were saying. It sounds like it's really not that primitive. When you look at the animals that have survived, like some of the brachiopods and, and others that are still extant today that are also found in the Cambrian, the lowest layer where we have these complex life forms, you can investigate how complex the animals were. And you find out that these animals are fully as complex as any animals today in terms of their cellular biology. It really makes it very difficult to believe in evolution when you, re when you find out how, how, how deep the complexity is inside the cell. And I think that's one of the compelling arguments that suggests that evolution can't explain what we see. And that complexity is found, and it's easy to demonstrate this logically, that that complexity is found in the first complex organisms we find in the Cambrian. When you go below the Cambrian, you don't have these levels of complexity. In fact, other than some single cells and, and a, a group of fossils of unknown affinities, you don't find anything below the Cambrian boundary. But once you get into the Cambrian, even in the very lowest part of the Cambrian, you find not only representatives of every phylum, ma every major group of animals, but you also find diversity. You find many species of these different kinds, trilobites, for example. And uh, we happen to be standing by the trilobite drawer so I can 
I can show you some of these. This is this is a Cambrian trilobite. Oh, that's it, awesome. It's it's clearly a member of the arthropods, the same group that has mm -hmm. ins modern insects and and crabs and and other crustaceans in it, and the spiders. It's all they're all part of this alliance that have a hard exoskeleton, and these organisms are very complex. They had a head, they had a tail, uh, they had compound eyes, just like modern insects. They had swimmerettes on the bottom with gills on them that they used for exchanging oxygen. They had antennae that came out the front. Mm. Very, very complex. And I'll show you, even though these are not from the Cambrian, I'll show you some of the other uh, diversity that we have in, in these <laughs> uh, trilobites. Here's one that- Oh, that's incredible. Looks what is like that? it's well furnished uh, for protecting itself. It's one of the Fake Ops Alliance, and you can see these compound eyes. You can yes. easily see the uh, omatidia, the facets of the eye. Well, that's hard to imagine this is a fossil. And there isn't any increase in complexity from the first organisms we have all the way through the fossil record. At the cellular level, now there, is, there are changes in complexity in terms of the ability to move. Mm -hmm. So these animals didn't have to walk around on land, and they didn't have just two legs like we do. So we require more complexity to move us around, but it's all a part of the aspect of, of motion. Mm -hmm. It's what we need to do to move efficiently. Well, when we were in the Grand Canyon, and, uh, and even Dr. Marcus Ross pointed out uh, those uh, pre-Cambrian rocks, those layers. Uh, so what we're talking about now is the, the fossils that are found just above that uh, great unconformity. Is that correct? Right, that's exactly right. Essentially, you hit, you're going from no complexity to the full spectrum of complexity that we have today. So now, again, the word primitive uh, kind of prejudices the mind, doesn't it? it to does. say that these are, but these are these are very complex creatures. They are, and they have the same complexity at the cellular level, and this includes their developmental biology as modern insects do. Mm -hmm. We can clearly establish that line of logic. If you're going to try to explain the origin of life, for example, you have to have a way of explaining the full spectrum of complexity that we have in modern cells. Mm -hmm. Nothing short of that will do. Okay. So, so since the Cambrian, since these first organisms occur, we see differences in diversity, but we don't see new complexity. Okay. And, and the, the complexity we do see is related to um, the ability to move. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that shows us that Whatever is behind the complexity we see in this animal has to be behind the whole scheme of things because you can't have this happening by random processes. But Art, how then do uh, you explain from the Genesis paradigm the fact that at these lower levels, uh, we don't have creatures that walk around. I mean, we have very, very complex and, and beautiful creatures, extremely complex, but we don't have the, uh, there's a sorting it appears to, uh, to have been done in those, in those fossil layers. There is, and it's not clear exactly why things are in the order they are, but it's clear that there is a movement from marine, ocean, to things that lived in underwater, mm -hmm. to things that lived on land. And then at higher levels, things that could escape from burial in uh, this water. So I think it's, it's clear if we were to, to start covering up the earth today, if we were to have another flood, the first things that would be buried are the things that live on the bottom of the ocean. And then subsequently, we would see layers of rock or layers of sediment that had things that lived higher and higher levels in the ocean. We'd get fish and eventually we'd get things that lived on the top of the ocean, and then we'd get things that lived on land. And, and eventually, if, if the burial kept going, we'd find the remains of complex animals like us. Yeah.